Hello. I feel very privileged to speak today. I um, wasn't sure if I was going to get a mic or have to mess with this thing. But yeah, let me, let me pray for us because I know I'm nervous and I want to make sure that the Lord speaks through me and it's not just me speaking. So let me pray for us real quick. God, I just want to pray, Lord, that you would speak through me right now, God, that you would be my strength and my weakness, Lord, and that, um, yeah, through your word, you would speak to us all, God. And I just thank you for who you are. Amen. All right, so I just wanted to introduce myself because I know a lot of you are probably wondering who I am. Uh, I'm a second-year intern with crew here at Cal Poly Pomona. And I actually focus on um, a sister group to crew called Destino. And so Destino has the same purpose as crew. We want to um, let people know about Christ. We want to help people share who Jesus is with their friends. And then we want to equip them basically for the rest of their lives to be able to do that same thing. But like all of us, we kind of have lenses. Like me right now, if I took off my glasses, I wouldn't really be able to read the notes that I wrote for this talk. I wouldn't be able to see. And I usually forget that I have them on. But all of us have kind of cultural lenses that we see the world through. And so Crew has been, uh, since it was started about 60 years ago, has kind of the white cultural lenses. And that really influences the way that things are done in Crew. Some positive values of white culture, for instance, are a focus on the individual and giving people individual freedom and development of the individual, whereas a positive value of um, Latino culture, which is the focus of Destino, could be like a family orientation where being a part of the family is very important and things like that. And so when we are learning about anything, especially when we're learning about God, we can't divorce ourselves from these lenses, but they can help us get a picture of um, certain values from our own personal culture, things that we were taught by our parents that match up with, with God's perspective. And then sometimes there's things in our culture that we're taught that do not match up with God's perspective. And so I wanted to kind of have this picture of, of glasses that we're walking around with all day long, and we don't know they're there. Sometimes we become more aware of them than at other times because we bump into people that have a different set of glasses on, and they see things a little bit differently. And so I want us to kind of have that picture in mind um, as I'm talking today. And um, yeah, hopefully you'll just be thinking about that as I'm speaking. So we've been doing a series called the, the One and Others. There's a bunch of verses in the Bible that have this idea and sense of community behind them. And the reason that we wanted to, to speak about different things um, dealing with community is that we wanted our community to grow in, in transparency and in realness, in a, um, authentic um, relationships, and we felt that that's what God was leading us to, to do um, as, as leadership of, with student leaders and, and, and staff. And so last week, Amanda spoke to us about conflict, about why we shouldn't um, shy away from it, how conflict can actually be good because it surfaces truth, and that reconciliation through the conflict is something that's really important. Ultimately, God is the number one reconciler. He reconciled um, us to himself through Jesus, and he did that because we are um, seen as enemies to him and, and a bunch of other different things. But once we come to know the Lord, um, God reconciles us. Two weeks ago, Brock talked about bearing each other's burdens. Um, I heard this secondhand from my younger brother because I actually was in Texas at the time. but Or I wasn't here, but... Um, Bearing each other's burdens could be maybe sins that we're dealing with in our, in our own life or maybe just some weights that are just bearing us down and are really hard for us to bear. And um, God also is the ultimate bearer of our burdens because he bore all of our burden of sin on the cross when he, when he died on the cross, um, when Jesus died on the cross and when he was resurrected. But also we can pray to God and we can bring our burdens to him each and every day. And so kind of along those strings, like what I wanted to talk about today is about um, a unity in Christ and kind of an under, underlying problem of any community. It could be crew, it could be um, your church, uh, maybe you don't go to church, but you s everyone can kind of see like, oh, there's some things that I just don't necessarily care for um, in this community. And so what I wanted to talk about today is a, a little bit about um, unity in Christ. So if you brought Bibles today, go ahead and open up to 1 Corinthians 1, 
We're going to look at um, some verses in 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. So I didn't make any slides, unfortunately, for today, but that's all right. You guys can forgive me for that. Yeah. All right. There we go. All right, so hopefully you're there. And so Corinthians is a letter to the church in Corinth by Paul. And um, the church is just a group of people that believe in Jesus. I'm just going to go ahead and read 1 Corinthians 10. Oh. So I'm going to read from the NIV version because it actually has the, the word one another in it. So 1 Corinthians 1, 10 through 17. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there are no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers and sisters, some from Chloe's household, have informed me that there are quarrels among you. And what I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another, I follow Paulus. Another, I, I follow Cephas. And still another, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom and eloquence, lest the, the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. So Paul's encouragement to, to the believers there was they have this problem. All these people are following different followers of Jesus. A disciple is just a, um, a student of Jesus. And so these students, these older students, basically, were teaching younger students about Jesus, maybe kind of like you might be here in crew. Maybe you're going to maybe one of the Bible studies. Maybe you go to Brock's Bible study. You're like, oh, I'm following Brock. Or maybe you're going to Carrie's Bible study or someone else's Bible study. And there was these things that were dividing them, and Paul was pointing them back to, but who are those people following? Those people are following Jesus. And so he says this in verse 10, and I just wanted to repeat it because that's the main point of Paul um, in this first uh, chapter is that um, I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly united in mind and thought. And so I don't know about you, but the first time I heard that, I was like, hmm, I don't think Paul's saying we have to agree about every single thing in our lives, that our likes and our dislikes have to be exactly the same. But Paul gives more um, meat and more emphasis to what he's talking about a little bit later, and, and when he, he emphasizes what he was put on the earth to do. And he said in verse 17, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. And that's really a big part of what we are here to do. If we have come to know Christ, a big part of what we have been here put on this earth to do is to preach the gospel and that Jesus has to be at the center. Jesus himself, when he was asked, um, teacher, what's the greatest commandment? A lot of you might be familiar with it. He said to love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul and with all your strength. The first commandment is that. And that, when we want to share with others about Jesus, it comes from a heart of love of God and it comes from a heart of, of just wanting to share what we have with him. And I think for myself, I forget that sometimes. Sometimes I, I go too much to, to preaching the gospel um, because it's something tangible that I can do. And I'm like, oh, I need, I need to be doing something. But I think ultimately what God wants us to do is, one, to just enjoy who he is to enjoy that relationship that we can have with him that's only available through Jesus, that we don't have to act our way into that relationship, but it's just available freely to us. And then out of that outflowing from, from our lives, it'll just spill out over, and, and we will be able to share, you know, this is what Jesus is doing with me right now. This is what he's talking to me about. These are the problems that I'm going through, and this is how he's telling me to deal with them. Um... 
Yeah, I, I wanted to share one way that, that I've kind of been, been failing in that. I don't know if, if, if um, well, actually, just a second. So, so before, um, before I, I share that real quick, I wanted to ask us a question. We're going to um, spend like a minute in prayer and asking God maybe to help us think about these questions. Um, we don't have a lot of time to discuss, but those are some divisions that they were dealing with in Corinth. But in apl- applying that passage to us today, what are some divisions that we have here in crew? Maybe you're visiting today. I don't know. I don't know everyone here. Maybe um, you're involved in your local church, and you see certain divisions that are taking away from the gospel, that are taking away from us enjoying who God is. What are some of those divisions? Maybe you don't even believe in God, or you believe in God, but you're not so sure about what it means to be a Christian. Even you can, can kind of get a sense by, by watching TV, by uh, having friends that may or may not be involved in the church, you can have kind of a sense of what are some divisions that are taking away from who Jesus is. And so that's the, the, the what question. And then there's the why question. I kind of already betrayed what I thought the answer to that question was. But um, why do you think that we have those divisions? So I want us to just have a, a couple, uh, like a minute of silence to think about those and, and just to pray. So... Um, we're going to go ahead, go ahead and close your eyes and ask God, talk to God about that. Maybe there's some individual ways that you've been a part, I've been a part of, of being division or taking away from Jesus. So, yeah, we're going to go ahead and take a minute. God, I pray that we would just, um, you would help us with that verse that Paul wrote to the Corinthians. That by your name, that we would all agree and that there would be no divisions among us, God. And that we would be united in the same mind and of, of same judgment, Lord. Amen. All right, so I didn't give you a lot of time. But I hope that, um, that this wouldn't be the first time that you're thinking about these things. That, that you would take an active part, that we together would take an active part in... Um, seeing the problem, and then seeking a solution. And so, like I said, I kind of betrayed what I thought the solution was. Whenever I'm not finding my satisfaction in God, I look for it in other places. Sometimes that crops up in my life as sin. Sin is not the problem. It's more of a symptom of the problem. The problem is we are not finding who we are. We are not finding our satisfaction. We are not finding our enjoyment. We're not finding our being in Jesus. And it can crop up in, in things that might not be necessarily sinful themselves, but we put in the place of God. I know for myself, there's a habit that I have sometimes when I get home, I'm tired. I'm like, God, I just want to um, kind of be entertained right now, and maybe I'll just flip on the TV. And for myself, I've noticed this pattern, and I said, why do I choose to look to something else, to somebody else, to some other thing to find my comfort. Why am I not coming to you, God? You say that you're the God of all comfort. Why am I not coming to you for my comfort? And so I know for myself, that's one way that, that God's been talking to me about in, um, that I need to, to go to him, go to him first. Not to say like, oh, watching TV is inherently evil or the devil or something like that. No, I'm not saying that. So don't, don't twist my words. But... Um, you know, just, I think, being aware of those sorts of things in our lives. You know, where are we going when we are tired? What are we going to when things are difficult? Are we going to God, or are we going to something else? Because if we're going to anything else, we're not going to find the answer that we need. Um, let's see. 
I think one division that I've um, kind of seen in my own heart, and I, you know, it could even come out of good things, is that I would like to see um, Destino specifically to, to send um, students that would be desirous to, to become interns here at Cal Poly and to go across to the world to share about Jesus with other people. And that's something that I've been praying once I came here. And the more that I prayed about it, the more God was reminding me of a couple verses, one of them being the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come and your will be done. But as I was thinking about that, it was more like my kingdom come and Sean's will be done. And I wasn't really thinking about God's will. I was thinking, this is what I think needs to happen, God. And God convicted me of that, saying, you know, you might pray to me, and sometimes your prayers might be good, Sean, but ultimately my will is going to be done and not yours. Ultimately, you need to be praying according to what I want and not just what you want. It's a good thing. We have a lot of good things that we can be praying for, but we need to be seeking the will of God in our prayers and in our lives. And if we're not, um, you know, it's not going to happen. And so there's a verse that I wanted to share as I finished up. Um, that just talks about this. So you can go ahead and open up to it. It's in 1 John 5. First John 5, sorry, 14 and 15. <laughs> so again, I'm going to be reading, I believe this is from the NIV. I'm just going to go ahead and read it. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. I'm going to read that once more. Sometimes, yeah, repeating can be helpful. This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we asked of him. So God has really been convicting me on that as well. Am I praying according to my will or according to God's will? Even if it's good things, even if it's like, God, I want to do these things for you, we need to come to God first and ask God, you know, God, what do you want me to do in my situation right now? What do you want me to do with my life? I think a lot of us want to ask, answer that question. And so that's my prayer for us. Um, I guess my application points would be, one, like we can only find our true satisfaction in the Lord. And through him, we can do all the other things. But also, um, two, is, you know, are we really praying according to God's will? And I would just encourage you, um, we're going to take one more minute, and, you know, I know people have to go to class, but we're just going to be silent and, you know, just ask God to, you know, what, what is your will in my life, Lord? So... pray that we could just approach you, Lord, and ask you for your will to be done, God, in our lives. We know that, according to that verse we just read, that you hear us, Lord, if we ask anything according to your will and that you would give it to us, God. So help us to have access to your will, to know what it is. Help us to study the Bible, because we know that your will is found in, in the Bible. Help us to just understand it, Lord. We thank you for who you are. We pray these things in your name, Jesus. Amen.
that was really cool just thinking about evaluating whether you're praying for your own will or for God's will and just how important that is. Okay, so real quick um, for announcements this week, we have grounds tonight at 9. Uh, men's time, that's at 9.30 on Saturday. If you don't know, ask a man. Um, and sweatshirts, today's the last day to sign up. And the rug, be sure to check that out. And contact cards. And now we're going to watch a video. My name is Tristan Cabral, and my story is about freedom from shame. When I was six years old, I was sexually assaulted by a stranger. It happened behind a supermarket in an old, dark room. And I was always sent to the supermarket to do small errands when I was... when I lived in the Philippines. I got to the room, but I remember being thrown from side to side, feeling dirty and disgusting. And I didn't know what was going on. When I got out of the room, I felt so empty and so broken. And I walked out of the supermarket, um, walked to the street, and I jumped in front of a moving car. I tried to end my life there. I felt so ashamed of what had happened, and I didn't want anyone to know. But I survived the car accident. I didn't want to tell my mom what had happened, so I hid it. I hid it well, with a smile. Uh, well enough that no one knew about it for a very long time. But then someone introduced me to Jesus, and Jesus knew what was happening. I was so afraid of what other people were seeing, what I had become, that I felt really unwanted um, and filled with shame in the inside. I was so tired of trying to cover up my shame and I couldn't do it by myself uh, anymore, and Jesus couldn't stand leaving me like that. Um, when Jesus saw me, he saw a boy with a clean heart, untainted and fully loved. He said that he loved me so much that he will defeat my guilt and my shame and replace it with unconditional love. And so I put my trust in Jesus. Having a personal relationship with Jesus hasn't always been easy. But it has been well worth it. He has taken me uh, uh, to a hard path where I need to learn how to forgive myself and how to love myself once again. He taught me the value of trust, the importance of having a community to be authentic and vulnerable with. His promise to restore me uh, and my identity has been a hard journey, but he has also promised that I would never do it alone. He was always with me. That's why I still put my trust in Jesus. And I no longer need to hide my story. And for those who have dealt with something similar to what I just told you, Jesus offers hope. Jesus offers peace. Jesus offers a love that can restore you. I invite you to get to know him. And I can say this with confidence because my story is about freedom from shame. So, <laughs> thanks for coming, yeah. everyone. <laughs> um, do you know where we're eating? No. Okay. Where are we going? What food place do you like? 